October 19th in 1971. The day was extremely foggy and dark. Cheryl had actually slept in that morning. Her brothers had gone to the bus without her. Now, the bus stop was just right up the street. A very short walk. But, sadly, Cheryl never made it to the bus that morning. Hi everybody, and welcome to my video series, Crime and Paint. My name's Sophie, and every Tuesday I come on here, talk about a true crime case, while I paint a painting. If you're new here, I would love for you to stick around, maybe like the video, definitely subscribe. And if you're a return subscriber, hi! Good to see you guys again. Thanks for joining. Today, we're going to be talking about an unsolved crime from 50 years ago. Yes, you heard that right. This case is over 50 years old and it was completely cold. Nobody was looking into it until the valiant efforts of one teacher, Beth Rowland, brought the case back into people's minds and she's worked so hard to get justice for Cheryl. So I would love for you guys to take a second and go check out her blog, Gone in the Fog. I'm going to leave the link down below. Now, let's go into Cheryl's story. Before I get started, I really just want to give a quick disclaimer. Today's video is going to cover some very dark, heavy topics involving a very young little girl. So if that is something that you feel might upset you, I would strongly recommend maybe skipping this video. That being said, now here's the story of Cheryl Spiegel. Cheryl Spiegel was from Kentucky. She lived there with her two older brothers, Mikey and Mark, her younger half-brother Darren, her father Billy Joe, and her stepmother Shirley. The morning of Cheryl's 10th birthday, October 19th in 1971, the day was extremely foggy and dark. Cheryl had actually slept in that morning. Her brothers had gone to the bus without her. Now, the bus stop was just right up the street. A very short walk. But, sadly, Cheryl never made it to the bus that morning. For the next 13 weeks, nobody knew where Cheryl was. Local police questioned everyone. Her friends, family, classmates, teachers. But nobody knew what had happened to Cheryl. In the local paper, they thought that she was a runaway and they reported sightings of her in possible local towns. But late in the afternoon on November 2nd, a milk truck delivery person pulled his truck over on the side of a unused country road. And he did that to relieve himself, you know, driving around in your truck, you don't really have a bathroom. So he pulled over to the side of the road and that's where, in the creek just beyond the road, he noticed a strange pile of rocks. And he decided to inspect it. When he looked closer and moved some of the rocks, he saw the arm of a young child and contacted the authorities immediately. Authorities were able to identify the body as belonging to Cheryl. She had been stabbed 26 times in a circular pattern. These wounds, some of them were so deep, they had penetrated her straight through from the front all the way to the back. There also were signs of sexual assault. Neither Cheryl's clothes or the murder weapon were ever found. It was impossible to tell if Cheryl had been murdered there or murdered somewhere else and her body had been left there. On her brother's 11th birthday, 
Her father was brought in to identify her body. On November 6, a small funeral was held for Cheryl, and she was buried in an unmarked grave, which is a little strange. Though, luckily, that amazing teacher I told you about in 2019, she actually was able to crowdfund enough money to make Cheryl a proper memorial stone. It's really beautiful. I'm going to have a link for that down in the description below as well. As soon as Cheryl's body was found, the local police and the Kentucky State Police worked together to try to figure out who could possibly have done such a horrible thing to such a sweet little girl, and on her birthday, no less. But unfortunately, the lack of forensic evidence made it extremely difficult for them to do so, even though they did compile a list of suspects. The first suspect was a man that lived on the same street as Cheryl. He was definitely suspicious to everyone around, even before Cheryl and after her disappearance as well. He would sit on his porch and watch the kids, and sometimes he would even take his car and drive up to the end of the road where Cheryl lived and watch the kids from his car. He also, well, not him, but his extended family also owned the land where Cheryl's body turned up. He, uh, he refused to really work with the police or cooperate much. Uh, he refused a lie detector test. He would just say that he had nothing to do with it, and other than that, wouldn't really talk to the police. Uh, but, you know, despite how all of that evidence would make you think this might be the guy, he actually did have a pretty solid alibi. He was a day laborer in Ohio, and he has a time card that stamps him in the night uh, before Cheryl disappeared and stamps him out after her disappearance. And again, with the lack of any forensic evidence, that's all you can really go on. The second suspect was a man that lived a few doors down from Cheryl. He was part of this, like, car stealing ring and would actually later serve federal time in prison for being a part of said ring. Uh, but at the time, he actually saw Cheryl leave her house and go up the street and he said that was around 6.30 a.m. He also said when interviewed that he was the last person to see her alive was also known to be very violent. He was a drug user and was known to have been involved in domestic abuse as well. Does that make him Cheryl's killer? I'm not sure. The third suspect was actually the milk driver guy that found her body in the first place. You see, he lived a few counties over from where he would, you know, pick up the milk to go deliver the milk. And the road where Cheryl's body was found is kind of around where he would like start his delivery and end his delivery at the end of the day. So some people found that suspicious. And actually the time where he would like get to Cheryl's area would have been around 6.30 a.m. when she had gone missing initially. So that's kind of why people thought it might be him, but other than that, there really isn't any evidence that he was involved in Cheryl's disappearance at all. The fourth possible suspect was a man that initially wasn't on police radar at all. He was a local businessman, but several years after Cheryl's murder, he was convicted of sexually assaulting young girls, and he pleaded guilty. There was even talk that he possibly bragged about the murder later, though to police he denied this, and when given a lie detector test, he passed. I mean, can you really trust lie detector tests? No, but again, the lack of any forensic evidence made it really impossible to pin her murder on him. Shortly after Cheryl's body was found and the investigation started, newspapers started comparing her murder to a murder that had occurred only a year prior, about a year prior, 
to a 16 year old girl named Cheryl Siegel, not Spiegel, Cheryl Siegel. But the guy who murdered her had been caught at this point and was in jail. His name was James Findlay, James Findlay. And people theorized that perhaps like he had associates that might have killed Cheryl Spiegel. But there, again, is really no evidence of that, and I don't think the police ever really looked into that seriously. One thing that's important to note is that Cheryl's stepmother and her father were never considered suspects, though they did take polygraph tests and they did pass. One thing, though, that, you know, is a little bit strange is that, you know, her father didn't purchase, like, a headstone for her. And according to her brothers, after her death, he never talked about Cheryl. I mean, it could have just been the time. I know men had to be very tough and stoic back then, so perhaps that had something to do with him just not wanting to talk about it. But it still is strange. And only two months after the incident, the family picked up and moved. Which again, I understand to some degree because you lost your child, maybe you just want to move on, but it's still something to take note of. So those are the suspects that they have, and it could be one of them, or it could be someone else entirely. I, I don't know. What do you guys think? Do you have any theories about this case? I mean, I would 100% really push you guys to go and check out the Gone in the Fog blog. Come up with your own theories, think about what could possibly have happened. Any support that we can give toward this case would be so great. I mean, this young girl deserves to get justice for what happened to her. It's just not fair. And it's been over 50 years, and to think that whoever did this to Cheryl could still be out there... Ugh, it's so disheartening. So really, please go check out the blog and I'm going to leave a number for the Kentucky State Police in the description below as well. If you happen to know anything or you know somebody who knows someone who might know something, anything and everything we can bring to this case would be wonderful. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's video as well as my painting. I would love for you guys to come back and hang out with me next week. Also, please give me theories down in the comments below. I would love to have some discussions with you guys. And let me know if there's any cases you want me to talk about. I love researching all of this stuff. Well, love's a strong word, but I'm very intrigued by looking into this stuff. And I would love to know about some more cold cases, some more unsolved cases. So if you have one that you love, please let me know. I'll definitely look into it into the future. <sighs> that being said, I just want to say thank you guys again so much for coming and hanging out with me this week. I'll see you next week as well. Bye!